listening to the Up and Under podcast, starting in 3, 2, 1. Yo, what's up guys? Welcome to the Up and Under podcast. I'm your host, Hani. Joined with me, once again, remotely, it's Zishan. Yo, what's good, guys? Um... Yeah, yep. we're we're doing this remotely again. Uh, Listen, if you live in to, Canada, uh, you understand. <laughs> like, yeah, especially if you live in uh, in uh, Toronto or in Ontario, you you guys get it. You know. Yeah, basically, we're back in another lockdown. Hooray! And uh, yeah, so that just means it made things a little difficult to even leave your house right now because apparently uh, our premier thinks it's a good idea to harass people leaving their house to have police like, you know, yeah. question you for leaving your house, but. It is what it is. We still are committed to bringing you guys the podcast, and we still wanted to do the show, so we're like, hey, remotely is still an option. So here we are. I mean, it's not like we've been forced to do it for the past, like, year yeah. or so. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, we're used to it. Anyways, we got the setup already on deck. But we want to continue on with our coverage on, you know, heading towards the playoffs and, you know, talking about, you know, some of the teams that we feel are going to be in the playoff hunt. So we felt like it was a great opportunity for us to talk about some underrated or dark horse playoff teams who we feel have a chance to either A, make it to the playoffs, and B, potentially steal a round or two, being like a lower seed or being a team that, you know, you didn't really see coming. And there are quite a few of these teams, man. Like, you know, this year with the play-in tournament, it adds that extra element, you know, onto the season where some teams who you who have looked to be out of it, you know, in previous years could potentially make it into the playoffs and you know, who knows, might even, might win around, might do something. So, yeah, I mean, this this season is, I mean, that's crazy as it already is, man, but there might be yeah. even more craziness. Yeah, man, like, again, like, we're going to talk about some of this, uh, some of this, like, craziness of the season afterwards, too. Yeah. Um, But, yeah, like, this is probably the most, like, weirdest season we've ever seen. Yeah. It's it's up there for sure. Probably the most, it, it is, I think, the most, like, just, crazy all-around season um which provides like an opportunity again for a lot of teams who are you know lower seeded or or just scraping by into the playoffs for them to make a real uh you know make some real noise um and the first team we're going to talk about is the miami heat no surprise there to be honest because of the fact that again this is the exact same situation they were in last year and we saw what they were able to do last year they were able to make the finals last year Somehow, right? It's Miami Heat. The first thing we always talk about when we talk about the Miami Heat, especially me and Honey, um, it's culture, right? Like the culture of that that Miami culture is real, right? The the culture instituted by Pat Riley, you know, the 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 mob boss, right? Like Pat Riley uh, is is absolutely you know insane. He his work ethic. Um, it just drives the organization and it filters down to everyone in the organization. Um, and which is why you've seen them be as successful as they have been, even without um, talented rosters. So that's the first thing when you have to talk about the Miami Heat is just their culture of toughness and the winning precedent they ha- they have had with Pat Riley, um, Eric Spolstra, and then now with Jimmy Butler and Bam Adebayo, them making the again, the finals last year, right? Just that winning and, uh, you know, culture that they have. This year as well, they are a great defensive team once again. So they are sixth ranked in defense. Um, So again, we always know you hang your hat on your defense. Defense matters. Defense wins championships. Defense, um, you know, wins games in the playoffs. Again, their offense is the, uh, they do have the 25th ranked offense. But once again, you know, their defense is their main focus. And we know, you know, everyone's offense uh, stalls out in the playoffs. Everyone's dro- uh, offense drops off in the playoffs. With game planning, um, with the games getting slower, with the games getting more physical, offense drops off in the playoffs. And the teams that are able to be successful are great defensive teams. Again, minus if you're a LeBron James-led team when uh, I think they had like the 29th ring defense when Cleveland made it to the finals in 2018. But again, that's LeBron, right? In the playoffs, defense matters, and uh, e- even though Miami's offense sucks right now, 
We know in the playoffs they'll get it together. They'll be good enough to do it. And Jimmy Butler's isolation scoring, right? Isolation scoring is invaluable in the playoffs, and Jimmy Butler is one of the best at it. And we all know Jimmy Butler raises his game to the stakes, right? Um, and he, we, we all know what he's about. He'll be fine. Yeah. They've also added a couple of guys like Victor Oladipo and Trevor Ariza, uh, and also Nemanja Bjelica. So that just gives them even more added depth and even more options for them to roll with in the playoffs. Now, again, Victor Oladipo is injured right now. Hopefully, he can be healthy by the time the playoffs come around. But this just adds more depth and more value to this Miami team that's already there. And overall, again, it's just a very good overall team with lots of depth, um, with lots of great players, with people who know what they're doing, with staff members who know what they're doing, right? Eric, Eric, Spolstra, Eric Spolstra's staff who will put them in the best positions as possible in the playoffs. It's just this year you're seeing them struggle, obviously, with COVID. First of all, they got hit by COVID um, in the beginning of the season. And then, obviously, injuries as well, right? I just talked about Victor Oladipo being out. So this team has kind of had to just throw stuff together on the fly. Um, as is the case with a lot of teams, honestly, this season. But Miami is one of those teams that has had to just piece it together on the fly. And, you know, you've seen an inconsistent inconsistent team as a result. Um, but, again, we know what they're about in the playoffs. We know what this organization is about. And we fully expect them to at least, you know, win a round, to be honest. Like, I would not be surprised if they took someone out at the top of the Eastern Conference. Yeah, I mean, again, you you said that we we've you said it before. Like we've seen we've seen what Miami's been able to do at least firsthand. You know the way they play play the Raptors and and every other team and you know and how they were able to get to the NBA Finals last year was built upon you know their toughness, the culture that was set by Pat Riley and that you know for that organization. And you know we said it when Jimmy Butler even got to Miami. Jimmy Butler fits that culture. You know he fits what Miami's trying to do and. You know, that's why it was just a seamless fit. And it was one of the biggest reasons why Miami was even to, able to make that finals push. And then, yeah, like you said, like Miami's always been great on the defensive end. And in the playoffs, that's super critical. You want to make sure that you have a solid foundation on the defensive end. And then, obviously, when the offense slows, the game slows down, you know, you want to have isolation scores. You want to be able to give the ball to a guy and just have him get a bucket for you. And Jimmy Butler is one of the best to do it in this league, man. And, again, Miami has a lot of talent. You know, when you talk about Goran Dragic, Bam Adebayo, they have the young guys and Tyler Hero, Kendrick Nunn, um, and, you know, Duncan, Duncan Robinson. Robinson. Yeah, yeah, and all these guys. And then on top of that, they added Victor Oladipo. Well, actually, they stole Victor Oladipo from the Houston Rockets. Yeah. Uh, Trevor Ariza, who, again, like these guys, I mean, again, Oladipo's hurt right now. Ariza and Bilicio, these aren't big names, but these are guys who can potentially, like Jay Crowder last year, get hot in the playoffs because they've been there. They've done that, especially in the case of Trevor Ariza. You know, he's a seasoned veteran. He's been there. He's done it all. You know, he can come up big for you. And yeah, like this is a good team and it, there's a lot of depth on this team. And they, But they play hard. This team is going to play hard each and every single possession. And that's key in the playoffs. You want to make sure everyone's playing hard and that's how you win, win rounds. And I really, I mean, just from a personal standpoint, I hope Miami knocks off, you know, Brooklyn. <laughs> I don't think it's going to happen, but I would yeah. I would love if it happened. But yeah, I think Miami is definitely one of those dark horse teams that you can, you cannot not take the Miami Heat seriously. Because if you do, then I'm sorry, you're going to be, you're going to be packing your bags early and heading home from the playoffs. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the Miami Heat, definitely a dark horse team. Which brings us into the next team that we want to talk about. And yes, bit I know. a homer pick. <laughs> yes, I know it is a bit of a homer pick. But we have to talk about the Toronto Raptors. And again, this has not been a good year for the Raptors at all. Like, there's no, like this This is not what, they, what, they, what the Raptors expected to be. But there's no denying this is going to be a tough team to beat. Not only in the play-in tournament, you know, if they make it there. and then uh, But also in the playoffs. You know, this is a team that, again, has championship-level experience. You have guys who have been deep in deep playoff rounds in multiple seasons, have experienced winning a championship, experienced what it takes. And then not to mention the core of this team is quite young. You have guys in Kyle Lowry, who, again, is the age veteran. You have Fred Van Vliet, again, was a killer in, in, the, in the Eastern Conference Finals and the NBA Finals when the Raptors won. Pascal Siak, and we've all seen what he can do. And, again, he has something to prove in the postseason this year as well. 
And then OG Ananobi, who didn't even get a great opportunity during the championship run and is already showcasing his growth as a player this season. So there's a lot of talent still on this team. There's a lot of experience on this team. And that's so invaluable. You know, you can't take that away from anybody. But then on top of that, they have Nick Nurse as their head coach. And Nick Nurse has already proven himself to be one of the best head coaches in this league right now. But the main reason why he is he has that reputation is because of his adjustments. For him being able to adjust his game plan according to the situation, which is so crucial in the playoffs. You want to make sure you want to be able to adjust when things aren't going your way, when a certain matchup is dominating you. You want to adjust to those. You can't be stagnant. And Nick Nurse has shown, you know, each year he's coached his team, he's not afraid to change things up. I think he's used like what 26 different starting lineups this season. Now, yeah. granted, a lot of that had to do with the injuries, the COVID, and you know, you know, not having players available. But Nick Nurse will throw, will, isn't afraid to mix combinations and do different things to to put his team in the best position to win. Then on top of that, the Raptors still have a great defense despite this horrendous and honestly, in my opinion, a fake season. Um, they still have a good defense. They're eleventh in defensive rating. This team knows how to move the ball very well in offense. They still can create looks. And again, like this season, we've seen it. They can. This team can generate great looks. The problem is making those those those, you know, the the looks they generate. That's the big thing. But they do know how to get those looks. They do know how to move the ball. And then and then finally, the point that I think a lot of people are overlooking is the fact that the Raptors are actually better tooled for the playoffs now than they were at the beginning of the season. You know, not only did they get a couple of decent bigs in Kem Birch and Freddie Freddie Gillespie. Who have actually been pretty solid, especially Ken Birch has been pretty impressive. Gillespie's been bringing that energy and that hustle, which was severely needed from from the center, from the big position for the Raptors. They also got a young two way guard in Gary Trent Jr., who again was a big playoff performer for Portland when he played with them uh, a couple of seasons ago. So that's the one thing. And then they also got a sharpshooter in Rodney Hood, who could get hot in the playoffs. So, again, the Raptors are better tool now than they were at the beginning of the season. And on top of that, they have the experience. They have the coach. You know, this team isn't going to be an easy team to beat, you know. And I could see them potentially, if they made it to the playoffs, giving any any team a hard, a hard time uh, in the first or second round. Yeah, definitely. Um, Again, more of a homer pick for us. But here, here's the reasoning, right? People want to talk about, you know, the Raptors struggling. And that's validated. They have struggled this season. But you talk about the beginning of the season struggles. First of all, you know, you go from arguably the best center rotation in the league with Marcus Gasol, Serge Ibaka, to uh, absolute garbage center rotation, right? With Aaron Baines pretty much as your only center and then Alex Len backing him up, right? That's yeah. terrible. That is absolutely terrible. Um, not to mention, not to mention the fact that they're the only team that's been on the road every single game. Let's not forget that fact. They're the only team in the trip. league, exactly a seventy-two game road trip, right? Um, then you talk about the when they were just starting to hit their stride, COVID yeah. happened, and that completely killed their team. Yeah, right? they got they to like the stuck. five seed. They they were at the five seed. They had beaten Milwaukee twice. They had beaten Philadelphia. Um, and then in the second team, the second game that they faced Philadelphia, they almost beat them again, right? And then COVID happened, so that completely killed them, right? And then after that, injuries, right? Injuries just decimated their team. Granted, now they're kind of tanking, so it's not really real injuries, I would say. But you know, like they've just had bad luck all around the season. To your point about their center rotation, now we've talked. To, I don't. Every time we talked about the Raptors, we pretty much said the same thing. All of the problems that the Raptors are having can be boiled down to the fact that they had no center rotation because that just makes everything harder, right? No center rotation means no rim protection. means everyone has to foul more because they're trying to stop the perimeter guys from getting to the rim, right? No rebounding, uh, no interior presence on offense, no short roll guys, um, kills the offensive spacing, right? It was just they had no center rotation, and because of that, like, they had so many problems. Now with Freddie Gillespie and Ken Birch, Ken Birch especially being as good as he has been, they actually have a legitimate center rotation. And since Freddie G and Ken Birch have gotten there, they've actually out-rebounded teams in their game, right? Which was an absolute, like, that had never happened before in the season, right? They were already always getting killed on the board. So it was a complete flip of the switch, 
for them to be able to dominate the boards the way they have been. And you're seeing their success as a result of it, even with the Raptors trying to tank. They're still winning, right? Um, so the Raptors, you know, if they decide not to tank and just embrace the fact that they could make the playoffs and they get to the playoffs, I think they could be a very tough out for all the reasons that you gave. You know, the experience that they have, just Nick Nurse being their bench boss um, and his adjustments and his performance in the playoffs. They could be a very tough out for whoever they face. Now, again, I don't know if they're going to win a round, but the point is they're going to put up a fight for sure. Yeah. And that brings us to our next team who could also kind of similar to the Raptors, right? Um, Just on the outside as of right now uh, of the, of the playoff race, but they could definitely pose some problems for whoever they match up to. And we're talking about the Golden State Warriors. Now, when we talk about the Golden State Warriors, the first thing we need to talk about um, is the fact that they have Steph Curry. That's pretty much the end-all, be-all for them and their hopes um, of any playoff success. The fact that they have Steph Curry means you have a walking 40-point bomb who has arguably the biggest offensive impact in NBA history in terms of his spacing the floor, his shooting, um, the fact that he doesn't even need to touch the ball um, for a team to be just completely scared of him, right? Steph Curry is the end-all, be-all. He's been carrying this Golden State team Golden State is pretty much, we've seen those stats, right? Golden State is a, you know, a solid NBA team, you know, like, was it 12th, like, middle of the pack around, you know, uh, middle of the pack or towards the top 10 um, team in the league. And then when Steph Curry sits, they turn into a G League team, right? We've seen those stats. So Steph Curry is pretty much the end-all, be-all. Um, aside from Steph Curry, though, they've actually managed to have a top 10 defense this season which is pretty weird if you think about it because of the fact that they they have a G League lineup half the time, right? They're, like, half the time you can't even name some of their players, right? Um, but the fact is they had a top-10 defensive team. Um, and that points to, you know, credit to that goes to Steve Kerr and his ability to coach. Now, again, a lot of people are always talking smack about Steve Kerr um, and calling him fake and all this stuff. I've always been a firm, uh, firm believer in Steve Kerr because of the fact that, I watched the Mark Jackson days. A lot of these guys that are talking smack about Steve Kerr uh, did not watch the Mark Jackson days and do not remember, or if they did, they do not remember all the stuff that actually happened behind the scenes, right? A lot of that stuff does not get talked about anymore. I was there. I remember all the stuff that used to happen, right? And and the impact that Steve ha- Kerr had when he came. Steve Kerr's led them to a top 10 defensive team. And that points to, you know, that again, credit to guys like Draymond Green, who has been a, you know, exactly what the Golden State Warriors need when he's in the in the lineup. Um, credit goes to Andrew Wiggins, two-way Wiggs, right? His nickname now is two-way Wiggs. He's been great for them. He's turned into a prototypical 3 and D guy. Um, that who you knew? Want he yeah, had that knew, talent. Bro? Yeah. Uh, you just need to get out of Minnesota, pretty much. Um, so, yeah, like, Golden State has a good defensive team, which, again, similar to my what I was talking about Miami, um, you know, that is what matters in the playoffs. Then on top of Steve Kerr, you know, being there, you also have a guy like Draymond Green um, and his veteran presence, his leadership. Him and Steph Curry being there, their presence matters. Their leadership matters. Klay Thompson being on the bench to help them out matters. You know, all those things matter in the playoffs. Um, and then finally, they do have some solid role players who could ideally perform on any night. Um you know, me being a Raptors fan, I, I, I've seen it. Um, I, I forget what game it was, but when the Raptors faced Golden State um, in one of their games, I think it was, I think like it was the first Williams one. or one off or something. It was the Game's first one. Lee had a couple threes. Um, you know, they have a couple of guys who can get hot in a hurry, right? Andrew Wiggins, Kelly Oubre, Eric Pascal. Uh, Damian Lee, Eric Pascal, even though he's kind of sucked this season. But, you know... Um, they have a couple of guys who can get it going, especially in the system that they're in, right? You know, you you have a chance to at least win a couple games in the first round if you're able to make it. Um, and obviously, again, they have to get in there with a play-in tournament. But, you know, you give them one or two games uh, leeway to get into the playoffs, and Steph Curry, I think, can give you like 45 points and you could have a win, right? And you could make the playoffs as a result. And then in the playoffs, anything ha- anything can happen, right, with, with Steph Curry being there. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with Golden State. 
But if they're able to make the postseason, that's not a team that you want to underestimate for sure. Yeah, I mean, again, I feel like the Warriors are in a very similar position to where the Raptors are heading towards, especially when you're talking about how the Warriors were last year, except the Raptors aren't as dramatic as the Warriors were, like because the Warriors lost Steph Curry very early. But again, like they have a they have a solid roster, they have a good coach. Uh, they just need some more development. Obviously, they're, they're trying to get their way back to the playoffs. But I think for the Warriors, we wouldn't be talking about them just as a fringe playoff team. I think if Clay Thompson was healthy. I think if Clay Thompson was healthy, I think this would have been a playoff team. But they still have Steph Curry, who is, again, you, you've said it, how great he is as an offensive threat. It, it's it's undeniable that he makes a very big impact on, on, on this team. Especially considering the uh, the lack of talent there is actually on this team, uh, and how they've been a G League roster. I mean, they got beat by the Raptors by like fifty, like what was it fifty six? What was it? I don't know. So some some big number like that. But yeah, so without that was without Steph Curry and Draymond Green. So the, obviously that was the G League team. But again, there's no denying the Warriors team has talent. You know, obviously Draymond he's not an off an offensive threat really anymore. But he can still provide you with that, with that deep, being that defensive anchor, you know, being that presence for you, being that all-round threat for you. So Draymond's always going to be there and the leadership. Then on top of that, again, you mentioned the role players. You mentioned Andrew Wiggins, who again has really reshaped his game. We've always on this show we've talked about the potential that Andrew Wiggins has always had. We always knew he had. It was just about him being in a system that can maximize that potential. And I think Steve Kerr is doing a great job maximizing his potential. Again. Kelly Oubre can be a very serviceable player if he's not trying to run out like Naruto and being some being the idiot like that he tries to be. He's actually a pretty serviceable player. And then on top of that, they have some decent players. I mean Damian Lee, Eric Pascal, they have some 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 decent players. So again, it all really comes back to Steph Curry. If he's if he's playing well, the team really feeds off his energy. This Warriors team could t- could potentially, you know, steal a couple of games uh in the in the first round, if they could, man, they they there will be a tough out for sure, uh, just based on the impact they make uh, make on the floor with Steph Curry, but yeah, Golden State is definitely another dark horse playoff team, which brings us to another dark horse team, which again it could be argued because again we could be leaning more toward recency bias, but we're going to, but we're gonna explain. We're talking about the Washington Wizards, and the Wizards again they've had a pretty garbage season overall when you look at like their numbers holistically but over the last you know bit of stretch they've been playing pretty well i mean they're six and four in their last 10 games they're currently on a four game winning streak which is for them it's like their championship um you know although they don't play defense i mean they're 20 second in the defensive rating this team is certainly capable of getting hot especially based on the way they play i mean they play with the fastest pace in the in the NBA, man, they 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 play fast and they they try to spread that floor, uh, they try to get shots up, they try to put up points. That's that's what this Wizards team is all about. And honestly speaking, I think uh, this is a team that, you know, again, isn't really a great team. But the main reason why we consider them a dark horse is basically because of Russell Westbrook and Bradley Beal. You know, their star power makes them a threat, especially comparing that to what other teams in the Eastern Conference play and race have. That's that's more star power than what you would say with the Chicago Bulls or even you can even argue the Raptors and the Hornets and the other teams that are in that mix. You know, Westbrook and Beal are two big names, the two big playoff performers who have proven themselves to be that, you know, those type of players. And if they get hot and if the team around them gets hot, you know, they they could have a chance, especially if you consider like let's put it in, let's let's put it out this hypothetical. It's the Brooklyn Nets taking on the Washington Wizards. You know who's on the Brooklyn Nets? Kevin Durant. Who does Russell Westbrook have a little bit of bitterness towards? Kevin Durant. So I'm just saying Russell Westbrook might be more incentivized to go play his best against the team. And Russell Westbrook, trust me, when you get Russell Westbrook mad, I think he plays a lot better. <laughs> And Bradley Beal, he's he's a stone cold killer, man. He wants to win, and I think if his team's in the playoffs, I think he's going to play very well to 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 make to make sure that happens. And then finally, the Wizards do have some de- some decent role players, and Denny Avdia, Davis Bertans. Uh, again, it would be nice if they had Thomas Bryant, but again, he's hurt. Uh, Daniel Gafford's actually been doing pretty solid, um, but again, 
the main what it really comes down to is Westbrook and Beal. Can they carry this momentum that they have created in these last like you know ten or fifteen so games and make a push to to be in the play in tournament and maybe in the playoffs? It's kind of unlikely, but I think if they do make it to the playoffs, they have a chance to be kind of scary. Yeah. Uh, shot Daniel Gafford, bro. I said I, I, I said that was a good pickup for the Washington Wizards. Um, and he's turned out really well for them, especially given the fact that, unfortunately, Thomas Bryant um, got injured earlier in the season. Um, but, yeah, to your point about the Washington Wizards, it comes down to the fact that they have two legitimate all-stars, right? Two legitimate, quote-unquote, superstars, um, which is a lot better than, you know, three or four af- – anyone after the fourth seed um, in the Eastern Conference, right? Nobody else in the Eastern Conference besides the you know, top four teams. I guess Miami as well, you can say. Um, ha- can claim the fact that they have two legitimate superstars on the team, yeah. right? And that's what makes the Washington Wizards so scary. Um, you know, their defense is obviously atrocious, as as usual, right? Uh, as is the case with the Washington Wizards. I believe that on Scott um, Brooks. Yeah, again. Um, Scott Brooks, you know, uh, we've already talked about him. Um, but yeah, like the point is their offense is what really kills, right? They can kill teams with their offense. Bradley Beal, Russell Westbrook, Davis Bertons, if he's able to, you know, get his usual, you know, let's say 39% um, shooting from three. They're a very dangerous team. You know, we saw them. Um, I think I, I named the stat last time. Um, in a couple of episodes ago for the Washington Wizards where it's like they they were at the time like 7-2 and two against the top like three seeds in each conference or something like that. Yeah, right? something like that. That points to the fact that, you know, Washington, when they step up to their game, you know, they bring their A game, they're a very dangerous team to handle. You know, that famous um, that, that, that famous uh, win they had against the Brooklyn Nets, right, earlier in the season when I think it was like James Harden's like second, third game or whatever it was, right? The Washington Wizards, with Bradley Beal and Russell Westbrook there, um, anything is possible for them, you know, in the playoffs. Yeah. Yeah, no, no doubt. I mean, the Wizards, again, they were probably the least likely out of, out of these teams that we're mentioning to make a make a run in the playoffs. But I think, again, they have a slight chance. If we're talking about dark horses, there's no bigger dark horse right now than the Washington Wizards, potentially, uh, especially in the Eastern Conference. Which brings us to the final dark horse team, who we think uh, is going to, who could play a factor in this year's playoffs, and it's the Portland Trail Blazers. Now the Blazers have one of the best offenses uh, in the league this year. They're the seventh best offense. They have a lot of weapons on this team, man. You have Dame, Damian Lillard, C.J. McCollum, Carmelo Anthony, Yusuf Nurkic, and then they added went out and added Norman Powell onto that team as well. That's a lot of firepower. That's a lot of offense. This is also a team that really shoots the three ball very well. I mean, they they have this. They make the most amount of threes in the NBA uh, this season, and they have the sixth best three-point shooting percentage. So not only are they making the most amount of threes in the NBA, they're shooting a very high percentage as well. So they're very efficient in their offense. And again, this is a team that has a lot of a lot of good role players on their team. I mean, Robert Covington, again, he hasn't had the greatest season, but we know what type of impact he can make uh, on on the, not only on the defensive end, but he can potentially get hot from three and be a factor on offense. They also have Ennis Cantor, who can dominate the, the the glass and be a be a you know good scoring big off the bench. They also have guys like Derek Jones Jr. and Anthony Simons. So again, they have some decent talent. Obviously, losing Gary Trent Jr. and Rodney hurt hurt hurts a little bit. But again, this team has a lot of firepower. I think their one main kind of you know negative is the defense. But I think we've seen in the past with Portland is that. Damian Lillard, especially when he wants to lock up, he he lock, he he locks up, and I think CJ has that potential. Norman Powell has tools to be a decent defender. Uh, Robert Covington's again a decent defender. Is Robert Covington a really good defender? But again, they 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 have guys who could step up defensively. But I think what really would carry this team is their offense, having those options, and then on top of that, the playoff the play, the amount of playoff experience on this team is actually pretty insane. Not only you have Damian Lillard, who's been to the playoffs multiple times. CJ McCollum has been right there with him. Norman Powell won a championship with the Raptors. Carmelo Anthony, I mean, how many playoff series has he been in? And then, obviously, again, you have guys like Yusuf Nurkic, Anis Kanter. These guys have all been in the playoffs. They've all, you know, are veterans that have, that have been there, done that. 
So they could definitely be a team that could get hot at the right time, like they did last year to even get into the playoffs, or the year before that where they made it to the conference finals. And they can potentially put up a put up a good a good fight. So, but I think above all, the biggest thing about this Portland Trailblazers team is they have Damian Lillard, and I think he can put any team over the top. And he might just do that this year for Portland. I think this team has a, has a chance to win a cup, win a round or two. Yeah, no, you're right. Uh, Portland definitely has a chance. I think I would say for me personally, I was a lot higher on them earlier in the season, uh, maybe like around the trade deadline than I am right now, just because of the fact that I've watched a couple games, man. They're like their defense terrible. Like it's it's terrible. It's twenty nine. Um. <laughs> Yeah, their defense is absolutely terrible. Um, and again, we know, like, in the playoffs, offense stalls, right? Like, if you don't have defense to hang your hat on, unless you're LeBron James, like, you're not really going to do anything in the playoffs. And again, this kind of happened to them last year as well, right? Um, their offense was not as great against a great te- defensive team like the Lakers, and they weren't able to stop the Lakers. And that w- the Lakers, after that first game, pretty much killed them right um and you know adding a guy like norman powell is great for your offense but he's also a negative on the defensive end like cj mccollum like damian lillard and with norman powell starting now you have three guys in your starting lineup that are all negatives on the defensive end and that's not a recipe for success no matter how great their offense potential is um but also one one thing i want to mention for portland is the one big factor of this team is Yusuf Nurkic. When we've seen Yusuf Nurkic be good, the Portland Trailblazers are very, very good. Um, their defense plays a lot better. Their offense functions a lot better. The problem is Yusuf Nurkic is never healthy, right? That's always been the issue in his career. And he's ne- he hasn't been the same since he got injured, was it two years ago? Um, yeah. that, that big, uh, was it leg or foot, whatever it was, yeah. right? He hasn't been the same since then. Um, this season too, he's been a bit up and down, you know, some games he's very good, uh, other games he kind of looks a bit rusty. So, you know, which Yusuf Nurkic are you going to be able to get as, as the Portland Trailblazers, right? If you're going to be able to get a good version Yusuf Nurkic, then you have a fighter's chance against anybody, I would say. But again, the problem is like Yusuf Nurkic is not that guy all the time right now. Um, and so having that is not great. And if Yusuf Nurkic is not there, we've seen, you know, they have to throw in Ennis Cantor. Now Ennis Cantor is one of the best offensive centers in the league. But the problem is he's <laughs> the worst uh, defensive center in the league, right? He's like a minus and five. And that's being the point about Ennis. Yeah, that's being the point about Ennis Cantor. Um, if he was just able to be an average defensive player, he would be such a beast, right? But again, he, he's terrible defensively. And so you have a bunch of guys on your team that can't defend at all, pretty much, right? Throw in Carmelo Anthony. He's gone. He's a bit better right now than, uh, you know, than we initially thought he would be. But it's not a great team defensively, and that's where my issue with Portland lies. Um, you know, in the playoffs, when offense stalls, again, you have to hang your hat on defense. If you don't have a defense to hang your hat on, you're not going to get very far. Um, but again, contrary to my point, to your point, um, Damian Lillard is there. They have a great offense, so I mean, you know, they have a fighter's chance against anybody. I mean, I will contradict, you know, come back to you with one point. Again, the the main problem with previous years in Portland Trailblazers teams is like, sure, they've had great offenses in the past, but it was mainly because of Damian Lillard and CJ McCollum. They never really had multiple outlets to spread their offense out to make defenses, you know, pay for doubling. And I think this season they have that now with the potential of Carmelo Anthony getting hot, Norman Powell stepping up, potentially a Yusuf Nurkic stepping up. You know, they have other guys who, again, if you double Dame and CJ, they can give the ball to and then still generate the same level of offense that they were generating in the regular season. Norman Powell, I think, is the big one. Norman Powell is big. Again, we've seen him. He's the big potential one. He's big potential. Again, especially we've seen playoff norm. First hand with the Raptors. So I think he Norman Powell is one of those guys who I think he's very key for Portland this year. But again, Portland definitely has a, a very good chance this year. It's just about again, like you said, like will how badly will the offense stall to the point where will the defense, you know, kind of 
of the lack of defense overtake that or not. But we'll see what happens. But those were five teams who we think are dark horse playoff teams. Definitely let us know what you guys think. Do you agree or disagree? Which teams do you think will be dark horse playoff teams heading into the 2021 playoffs? And moving on to the up and under segment for this week, we first want to start off with a few somber news. Uh, Obviously, the first of which is LaMarcus Aldridge uh, announced his retirement earlier this week due to a a heart condition. Obviously, he's been playing with an irregular uh, heartbeat. Uh, You know, I heard the name of the condition, but I, I, I forgot it. I mean, obviously, I forgot I'm not a doctor, but it's basically it was an irregular heartbeat, and apparently the conditions it's it's a, a something you're born with, but that you only learn about the symptoms later on in life. And I think he had a flare up where you know he like it was a big scare for him, and you know that was something that he realized that you know what his health is priority number one, and uh, he decided to retire. And then good for him, man. He he you know he put his he put his health over everything, which is. 100% understandable and uh, yeah he's had a pretty good 15 year career man like he was honestly there was a time he was one of the best bigs in basketball and I think a lot of people have forgotten about that but I think at least especially for us you know watching him in Portland and being able to see him with you know Brandon Roy and Damian Lillard and kind of come up in the you know that that kind of way he was he was a very good player man and uh, yeah I hope wish him well in retirement yeah, I mean, it kind of makes us feel bad for telling all the smack about him last episode. But you know what? I won't take back my statements about him joining the Brooklyn Nets. That's pretty much my only one issue with him throughout his entire career. It wasn't personal. That, it wasn't personal. Is that Brooklyn Nets move, right? But everything else about LaMarcus Aldridge, man, uh, he's definitely a Hall of Famer in my books. Uh, now, again, is he a first ballot? I don't know about yeah. that. But, like, he's definitely a Hall of Famer in my books. He was one of my favorite players um, in the NBA for sure, just because of the fact that he had a very throwback game um, in the sense that he would always post up, you know, his favorite right block uh, post up. And it was automatic, bro. Like that turnaround fadeaway that he had in the post was completely automatic. And to your point, again, people forget he was arguably like a, what top three top five big in basketball for a stretch there yeah. um you know around like let's say 2013 to 2016 ish something yeah. like that like he was completely unstoppable man there's no way you could stop him on offense was he like a five um, seven time all-star seven time all-star yeah five time all nba i mean damian lillard said it best right he said retire that man's number um, yeah, absolutely. and i think he definitely deserves it right i think 12 definitely deserves to go up in the raptors in portland um now, again, did he have the best departure? No, but, you know, again, time heals all wounds, right? And LaMarcus Aldridge definitely had a great career. Um, I think he was definitely similar. Like, there's a lot of similarities, I would say, between him and Chris Bosh, not just the fact that they ended their careers prematurely, right? but a lot of similarities in their game minus the defense, obviously. Um, but, yeah, man, like, I guess, you know, uh, it, it was definitely the right choice for Marcus Aldridge. Definitely understandable. Um, and again, you know, obviously that's like the, the biggest thing, right? You're, everyone's just like thankful that obviously the the other thing didn't happen, right? Yeah, like, he uh, caught it early and he yeah, exactly. made the right decision. Um, so it's a good thing that I didn't get to that stage um, yeah. and that he's able to leave on his own terms, you know? And, uh, yeah, shout out to Marcus Aldridge, man. Definitely one of my favorite players in NBA history. Um, and, uh, you know, happy retirement to him, for sure. Wish him well. Another another piece of somber news that we want to we wanna actually jump into is uh, James Wiseman. Uh, and why not? We'll throw Jamal Murray in there as well. Both are, m- are missing the remainder of the season. Uh, James Wiseman has to undergo a meniscus surgery. Pretty scary. Could have honestly been an ACL. But Jamal Murray... Unfortunately, tore his ACL in a pretty. What was it? It was at the end of late at the end of a game, man. And uh, fifty seconds left. Fifty man. seconds left, man. And and it was just like a freak. Like he just, it was like a slight turn in his knee and bang, tore his ACL mm-hmm. and he's gone for the year. Uh, and it sucks, man. Uh, James Wiseman, you know, he's young enough, to, and like the Warriors, you know, aren't in a position where the the playoffs are guaranteed for them. That you know. They he could bounce back from this, but man, for Jamal Murray, it sucks for not only him, but man, for the Denver Nuggets, man. Like it, like 
they're a team that's trying to make a run in the playoffs and you just lost one of your best players and yeah that sucks man that's that's a that's a big that's a big loss for them yeah man first of all for James Wiseman um he didn't have the greatest rookie season but you know that was kind of expected um you know a big man who taking James Wiseman came onto the NBA court from pretty much straight out of high school right um and you know again it takes up time for those big guys to develop and he did not have the great season but you could see the potential with them and he had a few moments here and there um i think it definitely hurts for the warriors too because of the fact that you know despite the fact that uh he was very inexperienced and he made a lot of mistakes too um you could definitely use him in the playoffs right at least just as another body to have um and in, in their playoff push but unfortunately now he's not going to be there and then about Jamal Murray too, like to your point, man, this this really sucks because of the fact that the Denver Nuggets have, I think, had a legitimate chance at an NBA championship. Um, and now losing your second best player, I think, really hurts them. Um, and Jamal Murray too, especially because of the fact that we know he's a he's a big time performer, right? When when the lights are bright, that's when he shines brightest, right? That's when he plays his best. Um, and, you know, the fact that you won't be able to do that in the playoffs, I think, sucks for Denver Nuggets. One more point I'll add about Jamal Murray um, is the fact that, you know, he, his loss, his injury also impacts Kanda basketball, right? Like, his loss really hurts for Kanda and their chances and what they hope to do. Um, now, again, I don't know if Jamal Murray was confirmed to be playing for Kanda, but, you know, that would definitely be a great option to have. I think that really hurts Kanda on top of all the you know, waste FIBA's trying to screw us over. Um, you know, but yeah, Jamal Murray, I think, especially for him too, it really sucks for him because of the fact that he was having such a great season. And, you know, unfortunately, he got cut very short. Um, but again, good news is like now with modern medicine, ACL tears are not as bad anymore. And so, you know, hopefully he comes back even better uh, next season or I guess maybe the season after that whenever he comes back. Um, but yeah, shout out Jamal Murray, shout out J James Wiseman. Um, both of them hopefully rest up and hopefully come back to the court better than ever. Um, some more, I guess, news on, on the topic of injuries and whatnot. Um, are you up or under on the fact that Fred Van Vliet saying the 2021 season is the most impure year of basketball? Um, and he pretty much cited the fact that the business aspect of the league completely took over you know, the balance of, you know, joy and business. Um, and he said that pretty much the business aspect just took over this season. Yeah, I mean, I'm up on it. I agree with him in the sense that, you know, this year was entirely put together based off business. And as much as you can, you know, try to fault the NBA or, you know, kind of condemn the NBA for doing that, they're a business at the end of the day. They're trying to make money to pay players like a Fred Van Vliet who deserve pay raises and deserves to be paid. And so again, do I blame the NBA for doing for doing that? No. But at the same time, I do admit that this season has been up and down. It hasn't been the best basketball wise, the best product, uh, basketball product you can put on the floor with COVID, with you know, players getting hurt, the condensed schedule, you know, uh, the reshuffling of games. It's been it's been a bit of a bit of a mess, especially even for like the Raptors playing in Tampa. Like it's it, it it's it's not conventional at all. And I think you know I've been saying it. You know I've stole this off Alex Wong, but you know this season is fake. I I I don't see this season as real because like just you know just things that you didn't expect was happen was are happening now. You know like I didn't expect Brooklyn to be this behemoth of a super team. You know the Suns are amazing now. You know, Utah's an unstoppable team. Like, there's just so many things we never saw coming with this season. And I don't know if we would have seen that in a conventional year. So, yeah, I, I definitely am up on this. I agree with Fred Van Vliet. The business definitely took over. And hopefully, starting next season, things can start normalizing a little bit more. But uh, who really knows what normal is anymore? Yeah, man. Like, Fred Van Vliet, he does have a point. But again, to your point, too, right? It's... It's a bit of both, right? The NBA is a business at the end of the day. And if guys like Fred Van Vliet want to get those big contracts, right, some of these moves that the NBA is taking right now is going to have to happen, unfortunately. 
Um, and again, that's kind of a bad way to look at it, but it's what the facts are, right? That is the way the world works. Um, and again, Fred Van Vliet knows that too, right? But, you know, it's just, I don't think, I, I can't really blame any one person or one, you know, organization. I just think, like, you know, it's a messed up situation for everyone, right? Yeah. It's not an ideal situation for anyone. Um, and I think that's just what this year has been pretty much. Yeah. And speaking of uh, play, you know, people being, you know, upset with this season, uh, are you up or under on NBA personnel are concerned about the confessed schedule, you know, causing injuries? You know, we've seen now Jamal Murray just went down. James Wiseman went down. LeBron is injured. AD is injured. Uh, Donovan, Mitchell. Donovan Mitchell just got hurt. Like the list of injuries is just increasing, and an assistant coach even said that, you know, that this is the worst schedule he's seen in 25 years. So are you up or under on, you know, the condensed schedule causing injuries, and you know, was this the right move for the NBA? Um, I guess I'm kind of on the fence, or like I guess I'm up on it, but you know, data wise. Technically, the data shows that this is just like any other season, minus the injuries to star players, which are up. The star player injuries are up, but overall, the injuries are at a normal rate, pretty much, um, according to the data. But, you know, there's definitely something, you know, just the eye test, right? There's definitely something wrong um, with this season. Um, and, you know, I just another stat, too. I think um, I saw the stat about this being the biggest... Uh, this season having the biggest margins of victory or just like the most blows oh, yeah. since like 1972 or whatever it is. And that's due to the fact that players are like resting. Uh, players are, there's like half the team missing sometimes. Yeah. Uh, players are like super tired because they're playing like six games in like 11 days or something like that, whatever. So this season's been very messy all around. Um, and again, I don't doubt that's probably the worst schedule I've ever seen in my life. Um, you know, which is interesting because of the fact that the older uh, generations were always talking about how the schedule is so much softer now because they don't have three and four anymore. Uh, they're limiting back to backs. And now you have like the worst schedule like ever, right? Um, so, you know, it's been tough, I think, for everyone. Um, but. Unfortunately, again, similar to my last point about what Fred Van Vliet was saying, this kind of it's no what choice. It is. You, yeah. yeah, you can't really do anything about it, right? Um, the NBA has to do what they have to do. The players have to do what they have to do. Everyone's got to do what they got to do, right? And that's that's pretty much what this year has been for everyone. Um, and that's pretty much what this whole situation with COVID has been. So, again, it's not pretty, but... It's just what's got to happen, to be honest. So. Just get through the season. That's how we got Pretty do. much, yeah, exactly. I think somebody was saying, like, it's pretty much survival mode. That's yeah. what the season has been. So, I mean, that is pretty accurate. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, it sucks, man. Um, I guess staying on the topic, too, are you up or under on the fact that the Raptors got fined 25K for resting their healthy players? Let the tank roll. Listen, if you ain't cheating, you ain't trying. So, yeah. look, listen, like the Raptors, and also the fact that the Raptors, I feel like this is kind of also bullshit. I mean, I'm a little, like, obviously, you know, I'm a little, I'm under on it just based on the fact that they're, they're my team. And honestly, I kind of want them to tank just because what's the point of making it in the playoffs and getting slapped in the first round? Uh, yeah. Like, I, I, I don't see the point in that. You know, getting your hopes up and only for them to just... Especially in Tampa, bro. Like Tampa's got bad like, vibes. Like, yeah, man. These guys need to just get out of Tampa. Especially. Just get out of Tampa. Just go back to Toronto. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm kind of under on the sense that the Raptors, because of the fact that rescheduling games, have to play nine games in 13 days. So I don't blame them for resting players, especially players who have come off COVID in Pascal Siakam, Kyle Lowry's hurt, uh, like in guys like OG and Anobi recovering off of an injury... So I don't I don't blame them for doing that because look how how ridiculous the schedule is. But at the same time, the NBA also has a right because you shouldn't technically be doing that. But it also kind of reminds me of what the Spurs were doing, you know how Popovich got fined for, and the Spurs got fined for that uh, yeah. many years ago. But it's still kind of funny that that's still a thing in today's game, man. Yeah. But, so so the rule for the NBA technically why they find the Raptors is the fact that they did give leeway to teams this season in terms of resting players they're allowing teams to rest players but you're not allowed 
that you're only allowed to rest players when there's like a back to back, right? The Raptors didn't play since Wednesday or whatever it was. So that's pretty much where the fine came in. But again, to your point, bro, like this team's been decimated with injuries with COVID. Um, Paul Watson just got off the COVID list. Shout out Paul Watson. Dropping 30 points. 30. Yeah, shout out Utah as well. Um, but like, yo, this team's being just decimated all around, man. You can't fault Nick Nurse for resting, guys. Um, you know, especially a guy like Pascal Siakam, he just came off COVID. His back is broken from carrying the Raptors this whole season. Like, this guy deserves some rest, man. Um, so, you know, I don't blame the Raptors. I don't blame the NBA either for finding the Raptors, to be honest. It just but sucks. Again, it's just a mess. It's a terrible situation all around, uh, similar to my other points, right? It's just, it is what it is at this point, honestly. Yeah. And uh, at least here's some positive news. Uh, if you're Jabari Parker, but are you up on Jabari Parker signing a two-year deal with the Boston Celtics? I mean, I'm up on it. Obviously, I don't like. I'm happy to see Jabari Parker back in the league. Um, but I mean, I don't really expect anything to come out of this move for the Celtics. It's just a low risk, high reward kind of move. Um, a two-year deal, guy. though. Yeah, I mean, I'm pretty sure it's like some non-guaranteed kind of deal or whatever, right? There. But again, for the Celtics, just if he's able to play. You know, throw him in, in for a couple minutes a game kind of thing. Um, you know, Jabari Bar- Parker, unfortunately, has just ha- not had a great NBA career, at least for the standard that he was supposed to have. Um, you know, and a lot of that has to do with injuries, unfortunately. Um, but, yeah, like Jabari Parker, man, like I'm always happy to see players back in league. And, um, you know, hopefully Jabari Parker, maybe with this opportunity, can, you know, carve out, carve out a role for himself in the NBA. Yeah, maybe. Especially in a system with, like in Brad Stevens' system. He might have mm-hmm. some potential to do something like that. Yeah, and finally, are you up or under on Mark Cuban saying that the play-in tournament was an enormous mistake with Luka Doncic saying that he agrees with Mark Cuban? I don't think it's an enormous mistake. And again, it hasn't even happened yet, so we don't even know what it's going to be like. But I am kind of agreeing with Mark Cuban. I am a little bit up on this in the sense that um, is it needed? No, because I think it just creates a whole like an extra level of complexity to the playoff bracket that you know it, it really just like like teams that work fight hard to be the eight seed, the seven seed. Why should they get punished and have to play in a play in tournament, which could potentially knock out their their chance, the hard work that they did, just because you want to you know prevent these other teams from tanking, you know. I, I get it from their point of view, especially because the Mavs are the seventh seed, ironically. But it makes sense from their point of view. And again, I also I don't really see a point of it because basketball is typically a game where the stars dictate, you know, where you go. And I think the better teams typically win games and will make it to the playoffs. So I don't think we need a play-in tournament, especially because again, when you have a team like let's say like I don't know if, for instance, if the uh, I don't know if the Magic somehow got into a playing tournament spot and somehow made it to the playoffs this year. Would anyone be happy to see that? No, because you're knocking out a team who could have, you know, who could potentially have you taken that spot and actually been a been a good, better, produce a better product, produce a better series. So from that point of view, I dev- I do agree with Mark Cuban on this one. Yeah, this is literally exactly the point I talked about before the season started, right? Last year, the playing tournament made sense, right? Because of the fact that you had just uh, the the whole schedule had to be cut down, um, and you had to get to the playoffs, and you didn't know how to, they didn't know how to and the bubble, know, re- yeah, reconcile that with the season that had already happened, pretty much, right? It was a tale of it was pretty much two seasons that were trying they were trying to combine into one. Um, so the playing tournament, in that sense, made it made sense. This year, that. It's the exact point I made before the season, right? You're taking out, for example, a, a team that got to seventh seed on their hard work, get booted out, for example, by losing two games, right? By yeah. an inferior team. That that's not a great way to to play the game, right? Yeah. So yeah, I definitely agree with Mark Cuban, Luka Doncic on this one for sure. Yeah, and not to mention even when you're talking about like the the playing tournament from you know from last year even like it, it I think the NBA really just liked the idea of the competitiveness oh you know like can the Phoenix Suns make it to the playoffs and you know it was good for like betting purposes I think 
but I think competitively and holistically, it just it doesn't make sense to punish a team that worked hard to get to to the seventh and eighth seed. Yeah. Uh, so number one, it was there for um, again, as you said, to stop tanking, and number two, it was there to you know boost ratings, right? Because yeah. competitive basketball, you know, produces higher results, yeah. and that's what it was there for. But again, it, to your point, if it's like a team like the Orlando Magic getting in off of winning two games or whatever it is yeah who wants to see that right? nobody like nobody wants to see that so the nba kind of i don't know i guess this will this will be the real test and yeah. this year will be the real test if they continue to have this moving forward or not um i don't like it personally yeah i don't really like it either but with that, that concludes this week's episode. We hope you guys enjoyed it. Definitely subscribe to the show on all the various podcasting platforms you can have in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher Radio. Basically, wherever you can find a podcast, you can find us with the Up and Under Podcast. Also, check us out on social media, Twitter and Instagram at Up, Letter, N, Under Podcast. Facebook.com slash Up and Under Podcast for all the latest updates whenever we post a new episode or a reaction to news as they occur. Also, check out our website, upnoterpodcast.com. It's our central hub for the show. It's a place where we post blog posts with every single episode. So if you don't have time to listen to the full thing, you can read about it on our website. So definitely check that out if you haven't done so already. Also, subscribe to the YouTube channel as well. We post the full video episode of the podcast as well as the uh, clips of, of great segments that we want to showcase to you guys as well uh, for you guys there. So definitely subscribe there if you haven't done so already. And uh, yeah, man. Again, playoffs are coming soon. We're going to continue to bring you guys our content, you know, kind of bridging you over to the playoffs. But, yeah, this weird season hopefully is going to come to an end very soon. And uh, hopefully normalcy is going to be be on the horizon. But who really knows at this point? Hopefully. hopefully. Yeah. But with that, that, that concludes this week's episode. We'll see you guys on the next one. Take it easy. Easy.